Okay, I think we're on a roll now and you can start to see my cunning plans coming together. I've been asked for a while to do more guidance videos and whilst I'd already gone down this road a little a few months back, many commenters advised that we could do with some much more back to basics videos as a foundation. So we've covered how printers work and how to clean your prints and I'm sure many of you out there with resin printers don't just stop with the printing stage. Which is why I want to go over the process of painting your 3D prints because there are a few things to consider and if few things to be aware of too, along with some approach options. And since I've recently been accused of dragging out videos, and that feedback was fair when I reflect on it, let's get on with it. Hi, I'm Ross and this is Farhammer Videos. So first, you need some models. Now, I'm focusing on miniatures here, but I'm doing small and large models so you can apply much of this to almost any scale of model you print on a resin printer and I'm using one-page rules models that I got from my mini factory, and that's for two reasons. One is, well, I pretty much always use some models from my mini factory. Let's be fair, if you're into miniatures, 75 millimeter scale models or busts, then you probably also spend hours getting lost amongst the myriad of models available on that platform. And reason two is because this video is sponsored by My Mini Factory, and the reason is, well, it's to help promote One Page Rules' new narrative campaign. And again, I doubt One Page Rules need much of an introduction. If you've got a 3D printer and you're into war games, One Page Rules is like the default game that everybody plays. So, since I've loosely been promoting these companies for over a year now for free, of course I'm going to do it when they pay me. So for my sake, please check them out. There's links in the description below. So, you've picked your models and you've followed my videos on how to dial in your printer settings, now let's get them painted. The first tip I want to give is during the cleaning stage. Now, instead of using isopropanol that most people use, I use odorless clear methylated spirits to clean my models, which seems to last forever rather than go clumpy like ISO. But since I started using this, I noticed that if I leave the models to soak for 20 or 30 minutes, this actually softens the resin and the supports will just pull right off easily, especially with these one-page rules models because, well, the supports are incredibly well done. Now, if you don't want to use this stuff because, yeah, it's worse to breathe in than isopropanol, you can also soften resin supports with hot water before removing them, but if you do that, then I suggest you remove the supports after curing so that you don't risk contaminating the water with liquid resin. Again, if you need tips on how to clean your models generally, I've got a video on that that I can refer you back to now. Now, when it comes to curing, you really must do this before painting models, because if they're not fully cured, the uncured resin can actually react with your primer, and either it won't stick, won't dry, or will flake off later. Now, before you just go and start painting, there's a few more things to do. One of them is cleaning up any pockmark support markings on the model. And the reason for this is, well, any marks left behind are gonna stick out like a sore thumb when it's painted. Now with larger models, you may need to gently sand them down, but I take the same approach I use with plastic miniatures that have got mold lines. I just use a hobby knife because it's a very precise tool. And all I do is just cut off the tops of these marks and then shave them down with the edge of the blade so that those parts then match the shapes of the models beneath. Please be careful doing this because knives are dangerous. Another hurdle you may need to overcome is warped models. This has been the case with resin miniatures since year dot, but it can happen more with resin prints when they're slightly over cured. And this is an easy fix. Just get a mug of hot water and a mug of cold water. And just like removing supports, dip the model into the hot water for a few seconds to soften the resin. Then pull it out and hold the part in the place it should be, then submerge it in the cold water to set it. You might need to repeat this process on heavily curved parts, but it's super simple. Next though, you need to mount your models. Now, I'm typically what you would call a speed painter or army painter. My aim is to get decent results on a large quantity of models fast, rather than try to make every individual model a work of art. So, for my infantry, I just super glue them to bases, but I only use a little glue in case I later want to snap them off and put them on a more scenic base. For larger models, you might want to use some super glue activator to make it dry faster. And I like this stuff from Element Games because it's the only stuff I've ever found that actually uses a brush, where most activators are in spray bottles. Now, if you want to do a little more artistic painting and have some more access to the undersides of the model, I recommend you pin them to something like cork. 
For example, this Saurian Tyrannosaur rider has no surface that I could glue it to a base to without the glue being visible later. So, using a Tamiya pin vise, I drilled a small hole in his, um, let's just call it the saddle area, and then I used a paper clip to pin him into a cork. But once you get them mounted with something that you can hold during the painting phase, meaning like a base or a piece of cork or a pin, something so that you don't touch the model itself during the painting process, they're now ready for paint. But before you go just sloshing any old paint on, I recommend applying a primer, ideally something lacquer or enamel based, so that it's got some robust toughness to the paint itself. A good primer should create a strong and robust adherence to the surface, but also be a better base for your follow-up layers to stick to. And if you're a beginner, black is generally easier because if you miss any of the recess spots when brush painting, it reads as shadows anyway. You can use whites if you plan to go with a full contrast method, but I'll come back to the contrast approach shortly. Now personally, for primers, I like Citadel's Chaos Black. It's not the cheapest, but it's good and it's reliable. And I also like to preheat my spray cans in warm water to help paint loosen up and agitate easier. I've seen a few people ask why I do this in earlier videos. And you should spray this outdoors ideally on a warm and not too humid day. The only reason I can spray indoors is I happen to have an extractor which is rated specifically for this type of paint. So now onto some common painting approaches, but first I need to apologize to my editor for this bit, because I actually recorded pretty much the full painting process for all of these models in various ways, which is hours and gigabytes of footage. And he's probably only gonna use a couple of minutes of it at best. So sorry, Joe. The most typical approach to miniatures is brush painting, probably because it's the most accessible. And for this, you really just need a brush, a pot of water and some paint. But honestly, I recommend having a large mat and some tissue handy too. Now the general process here may seem obvious, but I don't know what you do and don't know. And actually to many people out there, this could be completely outside of what they even considered. I didn't know this and I painted for years as a teen before realizing this is actually quite an obvious approach and has now become the standard. So what you tend to do here is put your base layers on a model in various colors, throw down some translucent washers and that'll darken the recesses, and then using that original base color and brighter similar colors, pick out the highlights. Now in this process, I'm using the Duncan Rhodes Two Thin Coats paints because, well, they're made to have strong coverage and work well with this approach to painting. Now, if you're keen on this method, there are a ton of people online painting this way, like Duncan Rhodes himself, but also people like Pete the Wargamer, The Painting Coach, and Brushstroke Painting Guides are all worth checking out. Even as I go into the next approaches, you'll likely find that you need to do some element of traditional brush painting, so these are skills worth practicing. And you can get useful tools to help along the way, such as wet palettes, which help maintain paint consistency. But the key thing to have if you want to paint better is good brushes. So I recommend looking for some sable brushes from the likes of Rosemary & Co's Series 33 range if you're on the budget end, those are an absolute bargain, or Artis Opus, which are now the most popular brushes amongst miniature painters. Again, guys, I'll put links to all this in the description. Another rather simple approach to painting, which has actually existed for years, but it's had a resurgence recently due to the popularization of its new catch-all name, Slap Chop. Now this approach in general has you take a miniature primed in black and dry brush it with lighter shades of gray all the way up to white, and then paint over it with translucent paints like washers or inks. Specific types of these paints are designed to flow in such a way that the pigment sits heavier in the recesses and less so on the extremities. So coupled with the initial black to white layers created by dry brushing, this process essentially becomes paint by numbers and it's a great way to rapidly churn out a ton of good looking models. And despite this process's daft and almost cringeworthy name, it's a completely viable approach to painting. And if you want to see just how powerful it can be, check out Artis Opus's YouTube channel for some absolutely jaw-dropping results. It was thanks to them that knowing when I'm painting yellow contrast paints, I shouldn't use black in the recesses because it'll turn them like a muddy browny green color. And instead I should start with a light brown or even a pink. 
Now finally, I want to talk about the airbrush, and people think these are expensive, but honestly, you can get a solid starter kit on Amazon for around £100 or $120, and this is very much my preferred way of painting models. Not only is this one of the fastest ways to get paint onto a model, but it's also a great way of ensuring that those layers are incredibly smooth and you're not losing detail with thick layers of paint. Now, as a quick aside, you may be wondering what the recipes for these models are, but I didn't create them. This Tyrannosaur, for example, was heavily inspired by a similar model from Cult of Paint on one of their tutorial videos, and I just swapped out some of the paints they suggested for similar colours that I actually had. And I guess that's a good tip too. You see, you don't need to follow a guide for any specific model, or even the exact colours in many cases, though sometimes specific paint brands and types are used for certain reasons. You should find some painters out there whose approach you like, and then apply those styles and techniques to your models, especially in 3D printing, where there just aren't as many creators out there doing guides for each individual miniature or squad. I tend to follow a lot of advice from people like Byron from Artis Opus, Henry from Cult of Paint, and other people like Marco Frizzoni. So my approach to painting relies heavily on the tools I use more than the skills I don't necessarily possess. This final Tyrannosaur piece that essentially is the showcase piece of this video is essentially just an airbrush stage, a dry brush stage to pick out some highlights, a wash stage where you could even use oil paints because they've got a much larger drying time, but after that I tend to call my models done and just base them in a pre-mixed scenery pot, and I'm more than happy. Because that really is the point of this process, isn't it? You should enjoy it. Now, not everyone will, and that's fine too. I know some wargamers see painting as a barrier to getting their army on the tabletop, but I personally enjoy the process of painting. I find it quite therapeutic. Let me know what you think. And on that, as I come to the end of the video, I guess I'd like to ask you, would you guys like me to go into more detail about any of this process? I actually started this channel as a miniature painter looking at tools for a hobby, and 3D printers are the hot tool right now. But please let me know in the comments if you'd be okay with me branching out a little, maybe do some more hobby tool reviews, or talk more about interesting products when they come out, like Dirty Down Rust Effects, for example. Many people still don't know that I actually started with Fohammer.com years ago, and that's dedicated to talking about tools in the miniatures and models space. The point I'm making is, if it's something that exists in our hobby sphere, I've probably touched it, and therefore can give you recommendations on that sort of stuff too, so you aren't wasting your money on products that just aren't right for you. So yeah, that's just a quick question from me and where I want to take the channel. Let me know what you think. You can always just not watch those videos, but it's something I'd like to put more focus on going forward, but I am still dedicated to doing the 3D printer reviews. I want to say thanks for watching and give a huge thanks to our members for directly and financially supporting this channel. And I don't say it enough, but you guys are great. Again, thanks for watching. Until next time, nobody puts baby in the corner. Fohammer out. <laughs>